Hello, everybody, and welcome to a, a virtual panel of the American Religion and Literature Society. My name is Dave Morris, and I'll be chairing this panel. And um, this session is called uh, Religion and Utopia in American Literature Pre-1900. And we have uh, three exciting papers today. I'll introduce people one by one as they present. And then at the end, we'll, with a relatively small audience, try to have a little bit of a conversation. So um, our first presenter is John C. Havard, and he is Associate Professor of Early American Literature at Auburn University at Montgomery. Um, and he will be beginning a new position at Kennesaw State University in July. His book, Hispanicism and Early US Literature, was published by the University of Alabama Press in 2018. And he's now working on literary commentary on debates regarding religious liberty in late 18th century US literature. And the title of his paper today is Phyllis Wheatley and Religious Liberty. So this is John. Thanks, Dave, and thanks to ARLS for organizing the panel. Um, early responses uh, construed Phyllis Wheatley Peters' racial attitudes as complicit with slaveholding ideology due to her embrace of white cultural conventions. And you'll note that I'm, I've am i now adopted um, Honoré Fanon Jeffers' um, convention of uh, referring to the author by last name Peters, which was the, the last name of her, her husband, uh, rather than Wheatley, which is the last name of her, her enslavers. Um, so for instance, uh, continuing with my, my point, in an early essay, Eleanor Smith writes that, quote, blacks who are taught to think white divorce themselves from who they are. When they direct their energies, be they creative or otherwise, towards whites, they're never consciously contributing to their own liberation or the liberation of black people. Phyllis Wheatley did not help herself by following all the dictates of whites, nor did she contribute to the well-being of black people of her time, end quote. The quote, dictates of whites Wheatley Peters was accused of adopting range from neoclassical aesthetics to Christianity. In such readings, Wheatley Peters' piety was a liability, a marker of her failure to develop an authentic voice and appropriate skeptical stance towards the religious ideology that underwrote white American racism and slavery. However, recent attention to Wheatley Peters' verse that is placed it in its historical context has been kinder, noting her intentional, nuanced, and critical engagement with her culture. That more care careful placement is, has extended to her religious views. Smith criticizes Wheatley Peters for embracing conventional white Christianity. While Wheatley Peters' engagement with Christianity was certainly mediated by white religious institutions, was it conventional? First of all, contrary to the perception that Wheatley Peters' religious training taught her to accept slavery in the place in the social order to which it consigned her, James Lavernier explains that, quote, although it's true that biblical argument was used during the late 18th century to justify the existence of slavery, an analysis of the lives and works of the many New England ministers with whom Wheatley was associated reveals a far different picture of the Christianity that Wheatley learned than was previously thought. Thoroughly imbued with the revolutionary politics, of the times, the theological training Wheatley received from the pulpits and clergy of Boston during the 1760s and 1770s was based in large measure on impassioned pleas concerning the innate rights of all humans to personal liberty. These ministers were in fact involved in the Northeastern abolitionist movement that took shape during the revolutionary era and that led to the abolition and led to, led to abolition in the region. Wheatley Peters' religious instruction was not only socially, but also theologically progressive. As G.E. Thompson explains, Wheatley Peters' congregationalist religious community in Boston, as well as the broader network of intellectuals with whom she corresponded as a writer, was influenced by Methodism and Arminianism. Wheatley Peters was tutored at the congregationalist New South Church of her owners, which was rooted in the Puritan tradition but had been founded upon rejection of the Congregationalist Convention of requiring would-be members to relate a convincing conversion narrative to be accepted. Moreover, quote, while Arminianism was anathema to strict Calvinists, Thompson continues, many of its principles appear to have invaded the beliefs of the church Wheatley attended, the New South Congregationalist Church, the religious community of Wheatley's master and mistress, end quote. While like many early Methodists maintaining an interest in Calvinism, she would come to associate with liberal Methodist or Methodist influenced congregationalists such as Selena Hastings, Countess of Huntington, Reverend Joseph Sewell, the Earl of Dartmouth, and George Whitefield. These Methodists were sympathetic to social justice. As Lavernier explains, the attraction figures such as Whitefield and Dartmouth 
posed for Wheatley Peters may be explained by their interest in abolitionism. As Thompson concludes, quote, Wheatley's thought reflects a community, a branch of the congregational church that had developed, as Nathan Hatch puts it, an organic relationship between political and religious liberty associated with a new religious enthusiasm in turn, which in turn was informed by the newly emerging spirit of Methodism and its older spiritual ally, Arminianism, end quote. My essay takes up this issue of, quote, an organic relationship between political and religious liberty, end quote, as it manifests itself in Wheatley Peters' thought. Wheatley Peters' most notable reference to religious liberty comes in her 11th of February, 1774 letter to Samson Ockham, in which she explains that Americans who abuse the, quote, natural rights of black slaves, quote, cannot be insensible that the divine light is chasing away the thick darkness which broods over the land of Africa, end quote. She continues that, quote, the chaos which has reigned so long is converting into beautiful order and reels more and more clearly the glorious dispensation of civil and religious liberty, which are so inseparably united that there is little enjoyment of one without the other, end quote. In other words, Wheatley, Wheatley Peters argues that the Christianization of Africa illustrates African exercise of, of religious liberty. That exercise demonstrates African worthiness of political liberty, that is, that slavery is unjust. This letter holds an important place in the history of Wheatley, Wheatley Peters' criticism, its, 17, its 1970s recovery and the attendant recognition that Wheatley Peters publicly expressed anti-slavery views facilitated rereadings of her poetry that challenged the orthodoxy that she was complicit in slaveholding attitudes. Yet criticism has not extensively analyzed the reference to religious liberty or fully, or fully explain what religious liberty meant to Wheatley, Wheatley Peters, an important consideration given the context of viewing her as complicit in conventional Christianity and its relation to slavery. What was religious liberty to Wheatley Peters? Based on this letter and poems such as uh, Thoughts on the Works of Providence, I argued that the understanding of religious liberty present in Wheatley's writing was characterized by the following. One, a freeing submission to Christ's love. Two, an embrace of the Arminian Methodist understanding of salvation is freely chosen, universally available, even to the socially marginalized and dignifying to the saved. Three, room for the creative believer to carve out personal spiritual practices. And four, room within those practices for secular applications, such as promotion of social justice as opposed to passive re resignation to providence. So I'm gonna run now through those four, those four points. And this is gonna be a little brief. This essay is uh, definitely still under construction, but I'll do my best. Wheatley Peters' claim that because, quote, the divine light is chasing away the thick darkness which broods over the land of Africa, and that, quote, the chaos which has reigned so long is converting into beautiful order and reveals more and more clearly the glorious dispensation of civil and religious liberty, end quote, may seem at odds with an embrace of religious liberty. The language seems to mirror what Toni Morrison describes as the rhetoric of colonialist missionaries and literature, which describes Africa as Morrison puts it, quote, a dark continent in desperate need of light, the light of Christianity, of civilization, of development, end quote. Couldn't proselytization be described as an affront to religious liberty and resistance to proselytization, a legitimate exercise of that liberty? However, Wheatley Peters' view is consistent with the Christian concept that the greatest exercise of religious liberty is found in voluntary submission to Christ's love. Wheatley Peters' description of this submission emphasizes its freeing character, which both illustrates its connection to religious liberty and her construction, and would have been inevitably read in the writings of a Black poet as a tacit critique of slavery. Wheatley Peters expounds these views in the poems The Atheist and An Address to the Deist, which were thought by, uh, by John C. Schultz to reflect what Joseph uh, Sewell taught Wheatley Peters on the subject. In The Atheist, uh, the speaker implores the titular atheist to, quote, turn now, I pray thee, from the dangerous road, rise from the dust and seek the mighty God, by whose great mercy we do move and live, whose loving kindness doth our sins forgive. The lines emphasize that turning from atheism, the dangerous road, is empowering and leads one to rise from the dust. That rise enables one to submit to Christ's great mercy and loving kindness. Atheism itself represents an enslavement from which one can free themselves through submission. The atheist is, quote, blind, and their, quote, unbelief disturbs the peaceful mind, end quote. Submission to Christ's love involves freeing oneself from the slavery. An address to the deist continues in a similar vein, 
The poem should be read alongside the atheist, despite their differences in belief Wheatley Peters would have thought of atheist and deist as roughly one and the same. The poem is, again, possibly written from the perspective of Sewell, one of her mentors. Like the atheist, the supposedly free-thinking deist is described as subject to a kind of bondage. Quote, to Satan's snares are fluttering in the wind, whereby he hath ensnared thy foolish mind, end quote. The lines highlight this irony of the day as free-thinking self-projection by describing their mind as, quote, foolish, and their state as a form of being, quote, ensnared, rather than, um, rather than, rather than liberty. Conversely, the speaker admonishes that submission to Christ's love is the truly freeing agent. Quote, the vilest prodigal who comes to God is not cast out, but brought by Jesus's blood, end quote. Wheatley Peters continues that, quote, he came to save you from your sins and had compassion more than language can express, end quote. That is, Christ's love has an ineffable freeing force. Wheatley Peters' understanding of religious liberty embraces the Arminian Methodist understanding of salvation as freely chosen, universally available, even to the socially marginalized and dignifying to the saved. While her belief in predestination lingered, her exposure, to our, her exposure to Arminian Methodist views seems to have rubbed off on her work. Methodism stresses individual agency in exercising free will to choose or reject divine grace. In this sense, it offered to quote the poor and oppressed a straightforward path to righteousness that took account of human actions, as opposed to the traditional Calvinism that construed marginalization as external evidence of damnation. The emphasis on every individual's unique choice entailed a corollary emphasis on, quote, spiritual equality. I'm quoting from a historian. Peoples of color, quote, found this, this kind of Christianity a divine affirmation of their value as human beings. These, these aspects of Methodism made it appealing to the marginalized. Indeed, although Southern Methodism eventually reconciled with slavery, the early Methodist movement spurred anti-slavery social movements. Early Methodist leaders such as John Wesley and Francis Asbury spoke out against slavery. Some Methodists freed their slaves, and the church briefly passed a 1784 church law requiring emancipation. Peoples of color, quote, voted with their feet to join the congregations of Methodists supporting such views. In turn, writers such as Wheatley Peters used the language of Methodism to generate egalitarian rhetoric. The dignity Wheatley Peters acquired from this religious tradition can be seen in her frequent assumption of a position of, of authority in her verse. For instance, in the poem to the University of Cambridge in New England, uh, which is addressed to, to Harvard students, she used the imperative in addressing her audience, writing, quote, improve your privileges while they stay, you pupils and each hour redeem that bears or good or bad reports of you to heaven, let send that baneful evil to thy soul, by you be shunned nor once remit your guard. Suppress the deadly serpent in its egg, you booming plants of human race divine. In assuming this authority to warn students of the wages of sin, Wheatley Peter stresses her race. Quote, an Ethiop tells you tis your greatest foe. In emphasizing her blackness and African heritage, Wheatley Peter signals that despite her low social status, in contrast to that of the Harvard students, on the spiritual level, she's qualified to instruct them. This framing both emphasizes Wheatley Peters' marginalized status in relation to her readers, but also defiantly insists on her ability to speak with authority on the poem's subject. By calling herself um, an Ethiopian rather than an African or a Black in a religious poem, she claims an identity that grants her biblical authority to speak to her readers. Wheatley surely expected her readers to recall that Moses had married an Ethiopian and that Psalms 6331, 6831, sorry, predicts that Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. In this sense, Wheatley Peters insists on the dignity and authority she feels as a black woman who's voluntarily submitted to Christ's love and who has accepted its dignifying blessing. This gesture is consistent with the dignifying message Methodism provided believers of color by emphasizing their spiritual agency to choose salvation. The dignity Wheatley Peters drew from Methodism's stress on spiritual agency is reflected not just in moments in which she assumes this posture of authority but also in her oft-commented experimentation with syncretic spiritual practices in her poetry. For instance, John C. Shields stresses that Wheatley's classicism should be, should be read as a syncretic religious gesture. Wheatley's classicism is easily discerned. She, um, quoting Shields, displays a familiarity with uh, the Horatian Ode, 
syncretizes classical allusions with Christian elements, and discloses two adaptations of the ancient Apillion or short epic. Shield stresses that one of these elements, her frequent invocation of the muse as, quote, tends towards conscious syncretism, end quote. Although this was an established tradition in Western literature, quote, Wheatley, Wheatley cast her practice of such syncretism into her own mode, end quote. Shield stresses Wheatley Peters's use of the phrase, um, quote, heavenly muse. Analyzing passages using the phrase, he concludes, quote, clearly Wheatley's muse resides with the angelic host of the Christian deity. The phrase heavenly muse then effectively combines classical paganism and traditional Christianity, end quote. Although this is again, not unusual, what is, according to Shields, is that Wheatley Peters presents the quote, sun imagery as the central image pattern of her entire body of work. Not only do classicism and Christianity combine to make a structure neither wholly pagan nor Christian, a third theological element enters the picture, hierophantic solar worship, end quote. So he continues, it's probable that quote, Wheatley's parents were sun worshipers, end quote. This, this quote helps explain why in her slender body of poetry, she alludes to Aurora eight times, Apollo seven, Phoebus 12, and Sol twice, end quote. He concludes, quote, but what is of particular significance to Wheatley's verse is the un undeniable affinity of such a practice for the hierophantic solar worship which she learned as a child. Like her use of invocations then, her use of solar imagery exceeds mere convention and thus reflects her meditative religious consciousness in which classical illusions participate with unobtrusive compatibility. One of Wheatley Peters' most illustrative poems in this vein is Thoughts on the Works of Providence. The poem opens with the speaker commanding her soul to praise the sun, described as a ruler. Quote, arise my soul on wings and raptured rise to praise the monarch of the earth and skies, end quote. This invocation then shifts to the sun itself described as the muse. Quote, celestial muse, my arduous flight sustain and raise my mind to a seraphic strain. End quote. Wheatley Peters proceeds to describe the sun's role in God's providential design to ensure human happiness. Quote, adored forever be the God unseen, which round the sun revolves this vast machine. Though to his eye, its mass of point appears, adored the God that whirls surrounding spears, which first ordained that mighty soul should reign, the peerless monarch of the ethereal train. Of miles, twice 40 millions is his height, and yet his radiance dazzles mortal sight. So far beneath from him, from him the extended earth, vigor derives in every flowery birth. Vast through her orb, she moves with easy grace around her Phoebus in unbounded space. Wheatley, Wheatley Peters continues in this vein by stressing how difficult life would be without the sun. Quote, that wisdom which attends Jehovah's ways shines most conspicuous in the solar ways and the solar rays. Without them destitute of heat and light, this world would be the reign of endless night. She also stresses the sun's role in providing food. Quote, but see the sun's to see the sons of vegetation rise and spread their leafy banners to the skies. All wise, mighty providence we trace in trees and plants and all the flowery race, as clear as, it, as in the nobler frame of man, all lovely copies of the maker's plan." End quote. The poem concludes with the stage discussion between the human faculties of reason and love personified that suggests that love is God's greatest gift. This conclusion suggests a correlation between love and the sun. So I'm moving towards the conclusion here. Um, on my last point, Wheatley Peters' theology allowed for secular applications such as advocacy of social justice as opposed to passive resignation to providence. And it's, it's helpful here to return to her letter to Occam. Based on her correlation between individual agency and choosing to submit to Christ's love and the believer's ability to adopt personal spiritual practices, Wheatley Peters builds an anti-slavery argument in the letter the quote, vindication of quote, natural rights of peoples of color, Wheatley, Peters and Occam agree upon is predicated upon the Christianization of Africa. Those quote, that invade those natural rights cannot be insensible that the divine light is chasing away the thick darkness which broods over the land of Africa, end quote. Despite prejudice views to the contrary, Wheatley, Peters and Occam hold the peoples of color may freely choose salvation. Africans may do so in particularly African ways as Wheatley, Peters did via her hierophantic sun worship but they're choosing Christ's love all the same. Indeed, the letter ascribes the spread of Christianity, quote, divine light, and a nod to Wheatley's, uh, to Wheatley Peters' syncretistic association between God and the Son. The choice to freely exercise personal religious choices in this matter, 
for Wheatley Peters is dignifying to those who make it. She stresses that the choice ought to entail not just spiritual but secular salvation. Quote, the glorious dispensation of civil and religious liberty, which are so inseparably united, that there's little or, little or no enjoyment of one without the other. Wheatley Peters stresses that the desire for the salvation and the liberty that allows for it's available to all. Quote, for in every human breast, God has implanted a principle which we call love of freedom. It's impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. And by the leave of our modern Egyptians, I will assert that the same principle lives in us. End quote. For Wheatley Peters, based on this Occam letter, uh, religious liberty necessarily involved accepting Christianity. However, this acceptance entailed recognition of the humanity of peoples of color and thus that they shouldn't be enslaved. This is why civil and religious liberty are inseparable to her. Wheatley Peters therefore concludes with the scathing indictment of the hypocrisy of Christian slaveholders, writing, quote, God grant deliverance in his own way and time and get him honor upon all those whose avarice impels them to countenance and help forward vile calamities upon their, their fellow creatures. This I desire not for their hurt, but to convince them of the strange absurdity of their conduct whose words and actions are so diametrically opposed. The letter thus illustrates the potential for secular applications in her conception of religious liberty. Thank you. Thanks so much, John, for that really interesting paper. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it in a little bit. Our next presenter is Andrea Frankwitz, and she is Associate Professor of Literature at Gordon College, where she chairs the Department of English Language and Literature. Her teaching interests range from early American literature to modern American literature, including courses such as American Romanticism, African American Lit, and the great American novel, Henry James, and other, um, or sorry, and the broader American literature surveys. She's currently revising her manuscript project on 19th century American slave narratives. In her free time, Andrea enjoys leading cultural tours to Europe, visiting museums, attending plays and concerts, and making road trips to national parks with family and friends. And her paper title today is Paradise Pre-Gained, Heavenly Voices and Visions in the Memoir of Old Elizabeth, a Colored Woman. So please welcome Andrea. Thank you, Dave. Uh, just a little note, I'm no longer the department chair. Okay, uh, buried in obscurity for nearly a century, the slave narrative of old Elizabeth has been as overlooked by critics as the woman herself was displaced by her culture. Despite the slave narrative genres taking on its classic form and tone between 1840 and 1860 when the romantic movement in American literature was in its most influential phase, the publication of slave narratives continued well past the Civil War and into the 20th century. In his essay, The Representation of Slavery and the Rise of Afro-American Realism, 1865 to 1920, William L. Andrews observes, however, that other than what has been directed toward Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery, most critical attention has been on the antebellum slave narratives. While those accounts written prior to the war generally focus on the struggle for freedom and serve the abolitionist cause, the postbellum slave narratives implicitly speak to a different purpose. Although, as Deborah E. McDowell and Arnold Ramper said note in their introduction to slavery and the literary imagination, after the Civil War, many striving Blacks elected to join the forces of political conciliation between North and South and deliberately downplayed the hellish picture of slavery common in abolitionist rhetoric before the war, while others conspired for one reason or another with nostalgic treatments of slavery then popular, old Elizabeth does neither. What is, what is peculiar about the memoir of old Elizabeth, a colored woman, is not only that it might be read as either a slave narrative or a spiritual autobiography, but also that its narrator seems almost nonchalantly dismissive of her time as a slave with her manumission quite remarkably nearly glossed over. This is not to say, however, that her experiences and her representations of bondage could be extracted without significant effect to her ideas of personhood. Far from serving to mollify those unsympathetic to the cause of justice, the abbreviated narration of her time in slavery 
may be seen as reflecting the slave narrator's refusal to capitulate to hegemonic forces and as foreshadowing her own subtle and strategic assertions of agency. For old Elizabeth, the narrated experiences of enslavement serve a foundational purpose for explaining her early history and establishing transformative tensions. Old Elizabeth seeks to challenge the cultural assumption that anyone could or should be sovereign over oneself or another. She recognizes a spiritual enslavement as much more weighty and confining than that which any physical or legal bonds might prove. She has found liberty instead, not only in converting to Christianity, but also in becoming a person of destiny through faithfully imagining the eternal promised land. In her slave narrative, Old Elizabeth uses her heavenly visions, language of spiritual ecstasy, and metaphors of destination to confound worldly wisdom and authority and to affirm her liberated identity. Significantly, what Old Elizabeth has in common with other slaves is the fact that she has been, in essence, subject to a denial of personhood and has been under the control and authority of her oppressors in this peculiar institution. What she offers by way of rhetorical strategies in her narrative might be seen as countering these maneuvers. As William L. Andrews in To Tell a, Tell a Free Story has contended, some fugitive and emancipated slaves have, through the telling of their stories, offered a declaration of independence and identity and have thereby experienced a type of self-liberation. For Elizabeth, the telling of her experiences undoubtedly was important, but how she tells her story suggests and is reflective of a different or additional means of freedom, one that was not contingent upon her having first been manumitted. Such a possibility for freedom while still enslaved was also articulated in one of the most well-known and influential slave accounts, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Describing his battle with Mr. Covey as a turning point in his life as a slave, Douglas says, it rekindled the few expiring embers of freedom and revived within me a sense of my own manhood. It recalled the departed self-confidence and inspired me again with a determination to be free. The gratification afforded by the triumph was a full compensation for whatever else might follow, even death itself. He only can understand the deep satisfaction which I experienced, who has himself repelled by force the bloody arm of slavery. I felt as I never felt before. It was a glorious resurrection from the tomb of slavery to the heaven of freedom. My long crushed spirit rose, cowardice departed, bold defiance took its place. And I now resolved that however long I might remain a slave in form, the day had passed forever when I could be a slave in fact. Whereas for Douglas, this triumph, whether it consists of his physically beating Covey and or his renewed self-determination results in the heaven of freedom, for old Elizabeth, her triumph is spiritual and results in what might be conversely called the freedom of heaven. From the outset of the memoir of old Elizabeth, the colored woman, Elizabeth frames her narrative in an evocative way, referencing on her title page, Galatians 3, uh, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This epigraph thus prepares the reader for a layered text and sets the stage for the depiction of a different kind of reality, than one might ordinarily encounter even on the experiential level. In choosing to use this passage for her slave narrative and placing it immediately after her title, Elizabeth implicitly points to a spiritual reality not yet fully manifest on earth, but which speaks to her affirmed identity in Christ. The scripture not only serves to question, but also sets at naught that which the world privileges and gives credence to. This initial framing then sets up a pattern within old Elizabeth's account that suggests a different way of attaining freedom. One of the means by which Elizabeth separates herself from her slavish condition 
is through a heavenly vision of her spiritual state. She describes a time when, as a young slave, she feels so physically weak and alone that she thinks she will die, but sensing she's not prepared to meet her maker, her spirit cries out, must I die in this state and be banished from thy presence forever? I own I am a sinner in thy sight and not fit to live where thou art. Then with her spiritual eye, she sees an awful gulf of misery. And just when she thinks she's about to plunge into it, she hears a voice telling her to rise up and pray. When she asks Christ to save her, she immediately sees a director clothed in white raiment who leads her down a long journey to a fiery gulf. She discovers that every one of her cries for mercy and salvation raises her higher and higher. Upon seeing the savior standing with his hand outstretched to receive her, she thanks and praises him crying, thou hast redeemed me, thou hast redeemed me to thyself. What is especially notable about her initial reaction and this vision is that she speaks of her relationship to God in terms of spatial orientations. She suggests that it is her sinfulness which separates her from God, but her enslavement and the fact that she has nobody in the wide world to look to but God are what first bring her to her knees. By mingling the subjects of slavery and sin, old Elizabeth calls forth calls forth a doubling of associations, subtly prompting her readers to think of slavery as a sin and sin as a kind of slavery. With these implications, the scene offers a few interrelated readings. As Elizabeth calls out to God for mercy and salvation, she, in her vision, physically moves toward God and also brings herself nearer to him spiritually. Concurrently, she repositions herself in relation to her enslavement, moving away from her legal owner and becoming emotionally independent from him as she becomes dependent on God. In saying to God that he has redeemed her to himself, she not only indicates he has saved her from her sins, but also articulates a transfer of ownership, now making him her master and willingly becoming his slave. Relating this experience to her readers further enables her to confirm the distance she has put between her narrating self and her enslaved self and allows her to chart her spiritual development. Perhaps even more importantly, through the narration of this scene, old Elizabeth figuratively takes back the time in her life in which she was a slave and diminishes the power of her former owner and overseer by showing that in this moment she replaced them with God and thereby took some control over her status. Through her scenes of distraction or spiritual ecstasy as a slave, old Elizabeth also separates herself from her subordinate position. Describing these moments, she suggests a dual reality. Every day I went among the haystacks where the presence of the Lord overshadowed me and I was filled with sweetness and joy and was as a vessel filled with holy oil. In this way, I continued for about a year. Many times while my hands were at my work, my spirit was carried away to spiritual things. Her conversion experience has so altered her outlook that she can be engaged in the spirit realm while doing her work as a slave in the earthly realm. More than simply moving away from the reality of her position, she essentially transcends her physical enslavement. By writing about these times, old Elizabeth gives evidence that she's no longer bound and she undermines the authority of the slaveholders who commonly felt they owned a slave's body and soul. Relating something similar shortly after this passage, she tells of being sold even farther away from her family. For a while she experiences deep sorrows and, and plungings, but then through prayer, her situation changes. My peace gradually returned, and with it, a great exercise and weight upon my heart for the salvation of my fellow creatures, and I was often carried to distant lands and shown places where I should have to travel and deliver the Lord's message. Years afterwards, I found myself visiting those towns and countries that I had seen in the light as I sat at home at my sewing, places of which I had never heard. In both of these circumstances in which Elizabeth has been sold away from her family, 
the slaveholders have acted against her or been indifferent toward her. Though at first deeply affected with a sense of loss and loneliness, she, through praying and seeking God, removes herself emotionally from these conditions. The fact that old Elizabeth immediately follows up her descriptions of mourning with descriptions of being carried to distant lands suggests that she has put her narrating self beyond the pale. Just as her masters regulated her physical and geographical space, she figuratively prohibits them from encroaching on her emotional territory by not dwelling on her own suffering at their hands. The only times when she shows them having any influence upon her occur when she wants to illustrate their inhumanity. In these two scenes, however, she relegates the slaveholders to the distant background. Taking full advantage of these times of crisis, she transforms them into opportunities to speak of her spiritual journey. As she tells of her celestial travels, she figuratively breaks through the boundaries her master has set for her, implicitly argues that her identity is not fixed to her slave status. Creating another barrier between her narrating self and her enslaved self, old Elizabeth occasionally describes herself as having a divine commission. She first mentions this after telling her readers that the Lord redeemed her. Immediately a light fell upon my head and I was filled with light and I was shown the world lying in wickedness and I was told I must go there and call the people to repentance for the day of the Lord was at hand. In this passage, she not only presents herself as having a new nature, but also refutes slavery's chattel principle, which deems her subhuman and estimates her worth according to her ability to perform physical labor. Dolores S. Williams in her article, Visions, Inner Voices, Apparitions and Defiance in 19th century black women's narratives suggests that though there was no practice of ordaining women in the mainstream institutional churches, some, some black women, such as Elizabeth, found in their, in their particular religious experiences the self-esteem and courage to begin their public work. The urge to speak publicly about God and to defy those who interfered came from the empowering visions they had, the voices they heard in the apparitions they saw. While as a slave, Elizabeth is not even acknowledged by law as a full person, in sharing this vision, she here rhetorically overturns that decree, asserting that God has blessed her and thinks her worthy to be used for a high purpose. Implicitly arguing that she has stood apart from the world, world's depravity and that she has an elevated status with God, old Elizabeth enlarges the space between her narrating self and her assigned position of inferiority. This gracious calling of hers may account for how she speaks of her legal freedom. Although slave narrators generally show their, esca their escape from their masters as momentous occasions within their lives, old Elizabeth's depiction of her release from slavery is anticlimactic. Confining it to one isolated paragraph, she treats it nonchalantly. Some years from this time, I was sold to a Presbyterian for a term of years as he did not think it right to hold slaves for life. Having served him faithfully my time out, he gave me my liberty, which was about the 30th year of my age. Through her cursory description, she figuratively deflates the power of her masters, showing that in writing or rather dictating her narrative, she's now in a position of authority. Similarly, the brevity of the passage suggests that her obtaining her legal freedom barely made an impact on her. Rather than pointlessly making herself vulnerable by writing at length about how this new liberty changed her life and thus placing her former master in a superior position, she downplays it and moves right along to the next scene. Her placement of this passage holds significance because it sheds light on her apparent indifference to being released from slavery. On both sides of it, there are scenes in which she describes religious experiences. With this context then, old Elizabeth distances her narrating self from her enslaved self, implying that she's already psychologically overthrown her slave owner and has found in Christ a spiritual liberty which makes her legal freedom pale in comparison. Within her slave narrative, old Elizabeth uses heavenly visions and spiritual language to problematize the traditional determinants of authority, 
position, race, gender, class, she shows instead a different means by which one can read reality and assert agency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, for that wonderful paper. Um, our, our third and final presentation today uh, will come from Michelle Dostal. She is a doctoral candidate at Oklahoma State University, and her dissertation, which she hopes to defend this fall, examines how 19th century domestic novelists rendered home spaces in ways that carved out for women new identities established both within and beyond the bounds of domesticity. She's also a big St. Louis Cardinals fan, having grown up in that city and can't resist a good comic book themed movie or cooking or baking competition show. And she's currently working her way through um, her favorite Top Chef seasons. That sounds like a good um, uh, pandemic activity and especially when um, it'll be a little while before there's more British Bake Off. Um, the title of her paper is uh, Where Changes Do Not Come, The Anchoring Influence of Heaven in Susan Warner's The Wide, Wide World. Michelle? Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to thank um, the American Religion and Literature Society for inviting me to this panel. And it's just good to meet all of you, so. All right. The frontispiece of the Wide Wide World's first illustrated edition exhibits a ship tossed about on a storm beset sea, a fitting image to capture the essence not only of the novel's young protagonist, but of the era in which Warner penned her narrative as well. Quote, the period in American history during which Warner wrote, observed Sarah Quay, was marked by a powerful sense of loss, a result of geographical distance between family members and loved ones, as well, of, as, as well as of incurable illnesses and early, often unexpected death. At this time, westward expansion, as well as industrial advancement, prompted many Americans to take on relatively mobile existences, traveling from one material opportunity to the next. This, combined with the commonality of illness and death, also often prompting removals, resulted not only in a sense of loss, but in a sense of destabilization as well, one portrayed explicitly in the life of Ellen Montgomery. In the novel's first pages, we learn that Ellen's father, Captain Montgomery, has encountered financial difficulty in his law practice and plans to move he and his ailing wife to Europe without Ellen to take advantage of business and medical opportunities here. The near 10-year-old Ellen discovers she must now reside for an indeterminate length of time with her aunt, her father's sister, whom she has never met, and this news rocks her relatively comfortable world. The rest of the novel follows Ellen on her trek from her beloved mother and her New York City home to the uncomfortable rural farm of her cheerless but efficient Aunt Fortune, and along the way outlines the ways Ellen seeks to recuperate the sense of home she loses during this move. We observe her go through the types of loss described by Quay, for not only does Ellen lose her childhood home, but she also endures the early deaths of her mother and her eventual mentor, Alice. Yet while the novel highlights the anxiety and loss so typical of the era, Ellen's story even mirrors some events from Warner's own life, Warner is not without hope. As we, follow, uh, as we follow Ellen's storm-tossed journey from the home of her infancy to the world of rigid Aunt Fortune, we also glimpse the way in which Warner looks to religion and the kingdom of heaven as a means to anchor oneself in the midst of destabilizing loss. Several scholars such as Quay, Jane Tompkins, Brandy Paris, and Catherine O'Connell discuss the narrative with regard to 19th century ideas of domesticity and how the novel either buttresses or resists these conceptions. Considerations of domesticity do prove fertile ground for inquiry in this novel, so frequently categorized as sentimental domestic fiction, yet Warner embeds in her text a theme regarding home spaces, the theme of heaven as the only true home, that more than domestic considerations underscores what she sees as the answer to loss and instability. Tompkins and others approach this theme still within the context of domesticity, claiming that heaven is home in the novel translates into women imbuing the domestic spaces of earth with a heaven-like bliss. 
Warner's Calvinistic approach to the religious ideas she discusses and exemplifies in her narrative, however, suggests we must also explore this theme as the literal expression of a Christian belief, the understanding that the home of God in heaven is the Christian's true home, as opposed to any earthly residence, no matter how heaven-like. This understanding issues from several biblical verses, including Hebrews 13, 14, which reads, quote, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come from the English Standard Version of the Bible. This extends a sentiment described earlier in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, which explains the way in which the Israelite patriarchs, quote, acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth and seeking a homeland, choosing not to return to their earthly homes because, quote, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Mrs. Montgomery references these verses as she prepares Ellen for their parting, explaining to Ellen, quote, we have no continuing city here, but there is a home, Ellen, where changes do not come. And they that are gathered there are parted no more forever, and all tears are wiped from their eyes. Her words and the verses they acknowledge affirm belief in an eternal heavenly dwelling made by the very hands of God and residing in a lasting celestial city, notions that connote the stability and security lacking in 19th century home spaces where removal and loss always threaten to destabilize people's worlds. Given these implications, the belief in heaven as home forms an attractive hope for people suffering loss. This theme, however, develops as a progression for young Ellen, for just as John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress eventually becomes Ellen's favorite book next to her Bible, Warner's narrative similarly, similarly evokes a Bunyan-esque feel in its recording of Ellen's spiritual journey through the four or five years we follow her. Although Mrs. Montgomery introduces heaven as home early in the novel, Ellen, not yet a Christian, will have to grow into this belief, one she ultimately reaches in her quest to recoup some sense of the home she has lost. Warner not only situates this lost home as a location, the place in which Ellen feels safe and comfortable, as opposed to Aunt Fortune's, quote, bare and comfortless house, but even more so as a person, the mother who, like a home space, quote, would have been a sure refuge and protection from all this trouble. Ellen's nostalgic laments throughout much of the novel center more on her desire to see or hear from her mother than on memories of her New York City residence, illustrating the way in which Ellen's sense of home is enmeshed in the person she most associates with home. That Ellen conflates the person of her mother with the locational qualities of refuge and protection affirms the way in which geographer Doreen Massey theorizes, quote, that place called home in her book, Space, Place, and Gender, in which she defines place as an entity, quote, formed out of the particular set of social relations which interact at a particular location. Massey further explains that much of the upheaval people experience as a loss of home proves in actuality to be a rearrangement of social relations, implying that people's sense of home flows from the social relations they experience within the location they call home. To be sure, Ellen here faces changes in both location and relationships, but the latter change affects her at a much deeper level as she looks to her mother as a refuge and her true home for much of the novel. Quote, in a novel whose first word is mama, observes Dana Luciano, there is never a question for anyone other than Ellen that the mother is going to be lost. Ellen will indeed never physically reunite with her mother before Mrs. Montgomery dies, and Aunt Fortune proves no substitute for this home mother that she loses, instead becoming more of an adversary than anything. Having failed to find a comforting home in her relationship with Aunt Fortune, Ellen turns instead to the consolation she finds in the constancy of nature, a somewhat new relationship for this former city girl. In one scene subsequent to a fight with her aunt, Ellen, feeling sharply the sting of her recent loss of home, not yet her mother's death, however, finds in nature intimations of the deep bond she desires. In a chapter titled, quote, Mother Earth rather than Aunt Fortune, we begin to see forms of nature exhibit the comforting refuge-like characteristics displayed by Mrs. Montgomery. Quote, peace was the whisper of nature to her troubled child, the text reads, as Ellen finds domestic solace on a mountain ledge, quote, 
carpeted with moss and furnished with fallen stones and pieces of rock. Again, we see here the enmeshing of location and interactive relationship with notions of home. The resulting release of emotion Ellen experiences here indicates her resonance with this new home-like space and relationship. This mountain, known in the novel as The Nose, forms a central figure in Ellen's search for home, as it not only acts as the geographical center of the rural landscape, the text situates all residences in relation to this mountain, but it also functions as the central spiritual image within the narrative. The qualities generally associated with mountains, such as immovability, strength, and stability, encompass much of what Ellen and Warner and others in the era hoped to find in home spaces, but in reality did not experience. Ellen's acceptance of nature, of the nose, as a surrogate mother early in the text, illustrates her first step toward embracing the belief of heaven as home. For throughout the novel, Warner highlights a connection between the stability of the home-like mountain and the perfect stability found in God in his heavenly home. This metaphor harkens back to many of the biblical writers who liken God or his dwelling to a great rock or mountain. Quote, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God, reads 1 Samuel 2.2. Quote, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, King David similarly begins in Psalm 18, also proclaiming in Psalm 62.2, quote, he alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. By calling God a rock, these verses connect him with the qualities of strength and immovability characteristic of mountains such as the nose. And Warner then draws off of this metaphor to identify God the rock as the only one able to provide the stability Ellen and others crave. Not only does the nose's physical presence imply this metaphor, but allusions to it appear throughout the text, such as when Ellen's mentor Alice references Isaiah 32, 1 and 2. These verses speak of a king, God's son, and his princes who will be, quote, like the shade of a great rock. And Alice discusses this passage just prior to exhorting Ellen to, quote, flee to the shadow of that great rock whenever she feels her world rocked. Ellen's home-like relationship with the mountain also leads her to form two spiritually important relationships with differently aged women in the novel, relationships that significantly push her forward toward embracing heaven as the home for which she searches. These women, both of whom Ellen meets on the nose and both of whom live upon it, provide her with vivid examples of women who locate their home in heaven just as her own mother did. Her friendship with Alice, whom Ellen meets at that first poignant home-like scene on the mountain, proves the more intimate of the two and transforms quickly from acquaintance to teacher, mentor, adopted sister, and surrogate mother, all relationships that variously imply notions of home. The narrative situates Alice's domestic space halfway up the mountainside and depicts it as bright, welcoming, comfortable, and surrounded by the beauties of nature. The establishment of Alice's home halfway up the mountain also seems to parallel her position in the Christian journey toward perfection in God's heavenly home, a home she also claims as her own at various times in the novel. She has begun and traveled on her spiritual journey a considerable way, but still has more to learn. Ellen's relationship with Alice also leads to a relationship with the much older Mrs. Voss, a spiritual mentor to Alice who eventually mentors Ellen as well. The narrative depicts Mrs. Voss's house as oddly shaped and spare, but ultimately clean, happy, and comfortable and built into the mountainside. Um, as with Alice's domestic space, the house, house's placement near the top of the mountain likewise identifies her position along the Christian spiritual journey. The specific way in which Warner depicts Mrs. Voss's perch atop the mountain, in fact, alludes to two different biblical stories, that of Noah in Genesis chapter 6 through 8, in which his ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat's summit, and the wise man from Jesus' parable in Luke 6, who builds his house upon a rock. These allusions thus imbue Mrs. Voss with the characteristics of these men, whom the Bible characterizes as spiritually wise and faithful, qualities Mrs. Voss also displays in her speech and manners. <laughs> 
All of these things, Ellen's new relationship with nature, the mountain and its biblical implications, and the women who reside on that mountain, encourage Ellen and her spiritual progression and search for home, and ultimately point to heaven as the stable home she most desires. These all, in fact, perform the function of what Colossians 2.17 calls, quote, the shadow of the substance. They show in part and imperfectly what heaven is in whole and in perfection, a concept taught to Ellen by Alice's brother John. As John explains that in the earth's final days, all of nature, quote, shall vanish away like smoke and be burned up, Ellen laments the, quote, miserableness of this idea, to which John replies, quote, the new heavens and the new earth will be so much more lovely and pleasant that we shall not want to think of these. In these terms, the mountain in the novel, in its earthly strength and stability, ultimately demonstrates the stronger and ever more stable place of heaven as eternal home, and the relationships Ellen enjoys with Alice and Mrs. Voss serve as imperfect reflections of heaven's perfect relationships. Ellen, however, does not truly embrace this belief until illness and disease sever the last little thread of hope tying her to her mother and to her first original home. When she loses this anchor, her grief drives her into a stupor out of which she is delivered only by reading of Jesus. <clears throat> Quote, she began to cling more to that one unchangeable friend, Penns Warner, quote, from whose life neither life nor death can sever those that believe in him. And her heart, tossed and shaken as it had been, began to take rest again. Warner implies this as Ellen's Christian conversion. And from this point on, Ellen begins to look more deeply at what the Bible says about God and heaven. She matches what she learns there with all she has observed before this, such as the copies of these truths in nature and the spiritual encouragement of her friends, and finally comes to the belief that heaven is her one true home. This is the belief that anchors the storm-tossed Ellen for the rest of the narrative, and it significantly transforms her relationships with nature, with her friends, and even with Aunt Fortune. And just as she conflated location with relationship in her early conceptions of home, linking the New York City residence with her mother, so she likewise enmeshes location and relationship as she accepts the belief of heaven as home. We see this in the description of Jesus as the, quote, one unchangeable friend, which accords with her mother's description of heaven as a place, quote, where changes do not come. In other words, the location of heaven is invariably connected to the God who dwells there. Changes do not come in heaven because God and Jesus are unchangeable, stable, immovable. When Warner published The Wide Wide World in 1850, her publisher sent it to print without its final chapter, a chapter that Mabel Baker finally published in 1978 in her biography of the Warner sisters, and that the feminist press reprinted in their 1987 edition of the novel. This finally, originally unpublished chapter portrays Ellen and Alice's brother John as a recently married couple returning to the house in America that John has prepared for his new bride. While this ending might seem to negate the idea of Ellen finding a stable and secure home in no place other than heaven, a conversation between the pair as they observe two pictures in their home indicates the way in which this last chapter only reinforces the ideas put forth in the entire novel. Here, John explains that one picture, quote, is only the material outside with indeed all the beauty of delineation, but the other, quote, is the immaterial soul. He further explains that the beauty of the second picture exists in the way in which it, like, quote, a clear glass, displays the beauty of what lies behind it, a spiritual immateriality. Quote, what makes these features so lovely, he remarks, but the exceeding loveliness of that which shines through them. In this conversation, Warner presses home again the idea of shadow and substance, suggesting that if one sees beauty or strength or stability in things like nature or a mountain or in this last chapter, a comfortable domestic space, these only serve to reflect the greater beauty, strength and stability that characterize God and his heaven. This idea might also indicate the way in which Warner desires for readers to see her book. While some might see it as lacking in the, quote, beauty of delineation, this last conversation shows readers that the novel's true beauty lies in the way in which it, like, quote, a clear glass, allows the reader an unobstructed view of the full and perfect qualities of God and heaven.
In this way, her novel performs the same function as the novel's mountain. It shadows forth the substance of a coming home in heaven meant to comfort and anchor a storm-tossed 19th century in search of a surer home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And uh, thank you, all three of you, for these uh, wonderful papers. Um, <clears throat> I think now we can turn to um, Q&A or discussion. And um, I've been thinking about this as the three of you read. So um, if it's OK with you, I, I can get us started. Um, it seems to me that in some way, and in, in all three of your papers, I'm going to change the view here so I can see everybody. In all three of your papers, uh, directly or indirectly, um, the, the issue of authority really comes up, uh, particularly the authority of the writers, the characters, and the speakers to, um, to sort of define themselves within a context where that self-definition is denied, uh, whether it's because they are women, because they're enslaved, because they're people of color, because um, they are sort of uh, geographically unstable, migratory. And what I wondered, what I, as I was thinking about it is, um, there seems to be a relationship over and over again in which the writers engage the religious through the everyday and the everyday through the religious. And what I'm, and religion very broadly, so theological, narrative, scriptural, etc. What is the advantage to these, not just religion broadly, but to these particular sort of forms of, of Protestantism or of belief or of scriptural reading that allows that engagement to happen that is so advantageous. So in other words, to put it more simply, why engage these issues through the religious or these religious issues through the everyday? And that is meant to be a very broad question answered however you would like. All right, so I'm going to venture forth here, <laughs> just timidly, I guess, a little bit. <laughs> um, I guess um, I see maybe part of it as um, like for for like Ellen and for Warner as women, and and also probably for like um, Wheatley Peters and Old Elizabeth as um, women and people of color. Um, I think it's a way of being able to. Um, kind of take uh, take an identity of agency and identity of power um, that they don't necessarily really have in their existences. Like, you know, as far as like, um, I'm just gonna kind of talk about like Warner and Ellen and, and the idea of domesticity, um, like women, um, I think their identity was meant, I think people meant to, to see it grounded in these ideas of the domestic and, and almost kind of, almost kind of like their personhood gets subsumed in that everyday domestic kind of place. And so I feel like um, these ideas of spirituality, these ideas of theology and Protestantism, if they link them to kind of their everyday existences, it's a way of kind of breaking out to show that personhood, to show that I am not defined by this domestic space, or I'm not defined as my um, identity as a slave or, or something like that, that that's not who I am as a person. And it's a way of maybe trying to be seen, I, I think, possibly. Um, and um, so I don't know if that makes sense or anything, but those are just some of the things that I've kind of been thinking about uh, with my dissertation. So I hope that applies a little bit here, so. Yeah, I would say that would hold true also for old Elizabeth because there, uh, she starts off her narrative talking about her home life and, uh, her father uh, reading scripture to the family and this kind of uh, this little home life that seems so kind of close and cozy initially comparatively and how it's her mother who one might expect to be kind of nurturing <laughs> and yet she's the one that tells her you have nobody to look to in the wide world except God and so in some ways that strips her away strips away even that sense of home life that sense of oh that which i can look around and count on uh, as providing comfort for me uh, even even when she is eventually free from 
slavery, uh, kind of legal, uh, physical slavery, and goes out as kind of an itinerant uh, minister, she talks about how she's, it's as if she's doing spiritual battle, even with some uh, religious leaders who are, <laughs> she, you know, in, indirectly says, uh, are sometimes doing the work of the enemy, that is Satan, uh, in impeding the work of the ministry. So she's not even looking uh, around at those things uh, that might normally kind of give give her, give one a sense of, oh, okay, I'm in this position, I have so-and-so's approval, therefore I'm going to go out and, and speak. It's, uh, it's how she sees her faith as being internal. And that is something that then, I mean, one could say that's kind of, uh, it's, <laughs> it's both very much uh, kind of a, a daily, but also uh, so, something that takes her beyond her circumstances. It's both internal and also transcendent. And so it's not surprising that there is focus on some of these kind of, as you said, every, everyday details, that which might even seem kind of uh, domestic or, or homely, uh, but she even rises above that. So I'm not sure if this answers your question, but I, I think um, Methodism was attractive to Wheatley Peters, both theologically and socially. Um, you know, I mean, uh, just to give one example, the, the, the Earl of Dartmouth, as those of you who are familiar with Wheatley Peters are probably familiar with her, her poem to her um, to the Earl of Dartmouth, uh, which is ostensibly like a poem asking the Earl of Dartmouth to support the cause of the American Revolution. But so what the, the Earl of Dartmouth was best known for at the time was uh, supporting plans to to enlist um, enslaved peoples to to join the British cause and to fight against their masters. Um, you know, and, and, and um, thus Wheatley Peters is, um, you know, publicly um, familiar stance with this guy. I mean, so it's, it's, it would have been read as a pretty subversive, a pretty subversive act at the, uh, at the, at the time. Um, and, and I, and I think that, I mean, I think that, I think that Wheatley Peters found Methodism and some of these, 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 these figures that she associated with it attractive, both theologically and also socially. I think also, I mean, I was, I've, I've become really interested in these, uh, these, these poems to the to the deist and to the atheist. These are not um, frequently um, analyzed poems in the Wheatley in the Wheatley um, body of body of work. But so this poem to the to the deist, um, you know. So I mean, deist uh, were unpopular with um, Congregationalist and Methodist for obvious reasons. But so who's the most famous deist in American history? It was Thomas Jefferson, probably. And Jefferson is also well known for, you know, his racist uh, diatribes against Wheatley and his notes on the state of notes on the state of Virginia. So I mean, I find it difficult to read those poems without thinking of them as kind of response to to you know to to Jefferson. She's turning the tables on Jefferson's descriptions of her um, of her as a as a terrible as a terrible poet, um, you know, and describing him instead as he's he's a slaveholder, but instead he's the one who's 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 enslaved. And I I just think there's a lot of I mean, your question was uh, that these are authors viewing the everyday through the religious and vice versa. And I and I think that there's I think that there's a lot of that in Wheatley Peters. I think that I think that you know that that, the, that these poems contain religious commentaries, but they're also they you know, to return to like at one time, you know, Wheatley Peters was, um, you know, was criticized for seeming conciliatory towards religion and slaveholding and, you know, and, and, and so on, you know, and, 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 and then more, more recently, critics read this kind of tacit engagement with the culture. But I mean, it's really not even that tacit. I mean, a lot of this stuff would have been pretty apparent to readers of the of the time. It's just not as apparent to us anymore. And I and I think that there I think that you see see that in some of the poems that I talked about where there's this um, 
interweaving of social and religious commentary um, that that she's that she's engaging in pretty pretty cannily. Yeah, thank you. Those those were wonderful answers, and they kind of helped me think about um, how these texts are so further illuminated by not marking this absolute separation between the religious and the secular or uh, the theological and the everyday. Um, so thank you for that. Does, um, can I turn it over to anybody else in the audience for any questions or thoughts? Uh, thanks everybody for these excellent papers. And I was also trying to think of a question that would, that could be addressed to everyone and I'm wondering about, it, it seems to me that the critical intervention that you all are making is something along the lines of, if we pay a little bit more attention to how religion is working in these texts, that can benefit our understanding of how these texts are working. And in particular with uh, Professor Havard, it, it seems like the thrust is that some critics have been dismissive of religion in these texts, but if they pay attention to it, they can see that the, 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 way, that, the way that this methodism is working, it, it's a rhetorical resource for abolition. And, and it seems rooted in a rather banal historical statement that I don't think would be controversial, that Christianity was a rhetorical resource for colonialism and slavery, but also for abolition and liberty. I don't think that's controversial. But, but in the criticism of Phyllis Wheatley Peters, or perhaps in the criticism of slave narratives with old Elizabeth, do you find that, that it is in fact somewhat of a controversial statement to say, no, that the Christianity was actually a resource for um, abolition and for uh, advancing individual liberty in a sense? I mean, is this a controversial statement in the context of the criticism of this? I think that maybe it was at one time, um, 20 years ago or so. I mean, I, 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 um, I mean, Wheatley Peters also. I mean, she's her, her best known poem is on being brought from Africa to America, which opens by seeming to um, show gratitude for enslavement because through enslavement she was exposed to Christianity. Um, you know, so I mean, I think that there's this. This, that's you know that's that's frustrating, especially to black readers, um, you know, and Dove and I. So I think that there's been some, you know, some some resistance to the to the way that Wheatley uses religion. But I think in, in the criticism more recently, um, you know, that 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 that, that there's that, that it's become less controversial to point out. In fact, she's. Uh, you know she's she's drawing from religion to make abolitionist arguments. Um, let's talk more about how she's doing that. Um, that's been the trend. I mean, I'd say there's been a, a Wheatley Peters revival in recent mm. in recent years, culminated by this uh, book, The Age of Phyllis, um, that that Jeffers published last year. Um, that's getting a lot of attention now. Uh, critics have pretty much. <laughs> Uh, not given attention to old Elizabeth's memoir. Um, it was for uh, many decades uh, after the publication, initial publication, it was inaccessible. And then it was published, um, I don't happen to have the, the book uh, right in front of me. Initially, her memoir was published in uh, 1863. And uh, and then there was a time of decades where it was just inaccessible. And then uh, Schomburg, uh, along with Oxford University Press, published a collection of, uh, of uh, narratives by uh, women of color. But I think what has it not getting critical attention still is uh, a kind of maybe uh, genre confusion or the lack of is this a is this really a slave narrative <laughs> or is this a spiritual autobiography uh, and just that question it's pretty brief also it's about 19 pages and so I think in in large part those factors uh, account for why it hasn't received the critic critical attention and with Michelle I is, is 
the criticism suggesting that there's kind of a, an internalized, oh, I don't know, internalized patriarchal ideology surrounding domesticity. And so by, by paying attention to the way in which, um, the way in which Warner uses religious rhetoric to make the domestic divine, it's kind of like what Dave was saying. We're seeing the, we're seeing the transcendent in the everyday and vice versa. Um, you're suggesting that it's not as simple. It's not as simple as her being confined to this domesticity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think that um, you know a lot of the a lot of the critical attention, at least in the past, has been um, like focused on this, like how this narrative supports domesticity. Um, like uh, you know, it, it definitely teaches submission. You know, like um, that's one of the things that Ellen and that Alice and her um, mentors are trying to teach her is submission to like her aunt and to different authorities. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things in there about housekeeping, like keeping good house and, and just all of these kinds of things. Um, but really, um, you know, I, and, and so like Jane Tompkins, you know, in the 80s, she kind of situated that as the source of power for Ellen and for the narrative was this, this submission that she's using this submission as her power and her agency and her influence. But I kind of see it even going beyond that, you know, beyond just kind of the idea of making our homes here um, heaven-like, you know, um, kind of the idea of domesticity that women, um, that like kind of the home was the kingdom for women, you know, or whatever. Um, but I see, I see that, that, that Warner is really pointing towards this literal existence of heaven that is there for, for everybody. And so um, I see it as kind of um, a way of agency and power for women also, um, that, that if they can locate their identities in that place, that's a place where men and e women are equal. That's a place where everybody is equal. Um, that is a place where they can have citizenship. Um, because, you know, um, kind of just the ideas that are, are found like in Philippians of the idea of citizenship in heaven. And I think that that is really kind of implied here too. And so, so I kind of see that, um, that, that there's almost kind of a reaching beyond mm. domesticity and this idea of like heaven-like domestic places. I don't know if that is helpful. Did, did that answer the question? Well, I'm, I'm wondering, maybe... <sighs> Tell me whether or not you would agree with this. Maybe even for the hardened materialists among us, maybe this idea of transcendence creates a place where people can imagine certain possibilities that then can be manifest in the material world. Yeah, I think so. I think that that's true. Um, I definitely think that kind of finding an identity kind of in a spiritual sense um, can translate into then I don't know if this is kind of what you're thinking, but can kind of translate into a certain kind of reactive agency here on earth that then it kind of imbues everything that we see here in a different light. And it puts like what we're doing, uh, you know, like what Ellen does and what, um, you know, uh, Alice and, and all of these Christians within the text, what they do, it, like their spiritual identity kind of imbues everything that they, they do on earth and kind of in a different light. Uh, is that kind of what you're thinking, kind of um, maybe that they find an authority that maybe they don't find on earth and that kind of translates into their material world and how they react and how they do things there. I think it, it changes the way that they see nature, at least in this book. Um, they talk about stars and they talk about their landscape in ways that, um, in ways that's, that's very, that make them almost kind of like personified in a way, you know, that nature becomes like this, uh, another person within the novel even. So I don't know if that, does that kind of hint, like yeah. touch on your question? Sorry. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. If I may, that leads into the question that I had um, as I listened to all of the papers and I, I work with contemporary texts. So I'm very much an onlooker in these um, these texts that you're exploring, but very, very interesting. Um, and I kept, coming back to the idea of utopia and sort of trying to locate the utopia for each of the subjects that you're talking about. Um, and I think with, with John, I think the idea of utopia's social element is, is most evident 
um, because of you know that idea of Methodism. For Andrea and Michelle, it seems much more individual or maybe even located in a futurity of, you know, of heaven. Um, but I like the way both Andrea and Michelle spoke of space as being meaningful in, in these texts. Um, do you feel that the use of space in the writing is somehow a vehicle for talking about um, uh, this, the idea of the, the ideal world being made manifest maybe as Michelle put it, or um, where do you see utopic vision coming through in the works that you explore? I think that for old Elizabeth, it's this, <clears throat> it's this idea of not waiting for, uh, for death in order to kind of catapult her into eternity, but as she, she shows that as she's drawing closer to God herself, that she is actually assuming a kind of authority that's not given to her, not only by society, but even church leaders. And so this would also maybe <laughs> explain why it hasn't, why the uh, why the narrative hasn't gotten much attention, because there is still, you know, uh, among uh, Protestant churches, you know, some, some churches take a kind of complementarian view or egalitarian view. And so uh, the idea of a female minister, a traveling minister, no less, uh, still might be controversial or it might seem suspect. Well, she talks about how because God has appointed her, God has anointed her for this, this is what gives her confidence. It's not, I mean, she, she even talks about how it's really nothing of herself that gives her this authority. She's recognizing uh, who God says she is, and that's what gives her the authority. And in some ways, that's kind of like uh, knowing, knowing her place in God's kingdom in the eternal scheme of things is what brings, in a sense, heaven uh, to earth for her. And, and she can, despite harassment, despite oppression, even after she escapes from legal slavery, just being thwarted in her, uh, her trying to win people to Christ and do God's work, uh, but she still has that kind of confidence. Uh, and I think it's because she lives, uh, she tries to live in that place of where, where God has said, you are worthy, you are worthy she's enacting yes. a, a utopia that she understands that is at, at odds yes. with the world yes. that she's and even uh, yeah. among right. some church circles some religious leaders who try to thwart her saying you're a woman what <laughs> what are you doing here you know holding meetings i I just really quickly, I think for Ellen, I, I think that there's a kind of a similarity between like what YouTube Utopia does for Ellen and what it does for old Elizabeth and that there's kind of a, it helps like a separation in a way of being able to kind of place um, identity and place my like, okay, like this idea of this future home in heaven then kind of separates her from the earthly instability and the earthly loss. And it allows her to kind of like, it stabilizes her. There's a point at which after all, like after her conversion experience, she ends up in Scotland with people that she doesn't really know and that don't really believe the same things that she does. And it kind of rocks her just a little bit, but, but she continually looks at that utopic vision to ground her. So now like before, every every kind of loss and every kind of thing would just throw her but now with this conversion experience and this idea of okay my home the, the home I really want is in heaven so now I look at everything that happens to me here in a in a way that I can be grounded and anchored and stabilized and then that gives her more agency that gives her more power I guess to to um kind of deal with those things and to enact kind of what she wants to do here on earth. Yeah, and that does seem to be similar to what John was saying about Wheatley Peterson's sense of who she was in terms of who God 
believed she was, you know, her her worth belong, you know, in his belonging. I, I, your your question is interesting to me. Um, I mean, I, I agree with you that Wheatley Peters's view of utopia is, um, is is social in nature, you know, based on the spread of Christianity and the spread of abolition. Um, I, I think the to go back to, to Ryan's question, I, I, th I think that one of the interesting through lines in the history of Wheatley Peters criticism is, um, you know, is, is, is that the poetry is very social in nature. It's not, um, you know, there's this question of like, what was Phyllis Wheatley Peters? Who was she? You know, what was, what was she actually like? You know, who was she as an individual? Um, and and the, the poetry doesn't tell us a whole lot about that in some respects, unfortunately. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, uh, I think that that's the source of one of the frustrations that critics have had with Wheatley Peters historical historically is the the is that is that we because we you know because we've inherited a you know a, 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 a an understanding of African American literature and of like post romantic literature in general that she doesn't conform to that she frustrates our expectations. Um, you know, and, uh, and this is also this 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 book that Jeffers published last year, which um, through research and kind of creative reimagining, tries to you know tries to construct what Phyllis the the individual would have been like. I mean, there's a number of achievements of that book, but that's kind of one of them is the the like the you know the construction of kind of a drama around her around her as an individual. Um, I think that kind of speaks to that you know, that, 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 um, absence and our understanding of the, uh, of the, of the author. Um, yeah, that's, that's my roundabout answer to the question. Thank you. Great. I think we're, um, we're just about coming up on the end of our session right now, um, which is too bad because now I'm thinking about all of these things. Uh, it, it strikes me, um, that while these texts are, are and these uh, writers are very disparate, um, there, there's something utopian fundamentally about the notion that each text is taking that is saying that the present in some way is temporary, whether it is meaningless or meaningful, uh, social arrangements of the present or uh, the individual experience of the present is, is temporary, that there is something that either can be made socially better or that we can look forward to in the future, or that there is a model coming from outside of our current social conflicts, uh, and that model is coming from God, right? And um, gosh, that can be awfully oppressive in some ways, but it can also be um, uh, awfully liberating. Um, does anybody have any thoughts they want to add before we, uh, before we call it a day? Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you for these excellent papers and, and this conversation and for joining us today. And this was a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank all. It's nice to you. meet you. Thanks. Aww. Thanks, Catherine. Thank Thanks, Dave, for jumping in there. No problem. <laughs>